Welcome back to Anderton's TV, and I have two amazing guests today, all the way from Fender in California. I've got Levi Perry, Austin McNutt, uh, and they are the wonderfully named Master Builders, or they are two Master Builders from uh, Fender's Custom Shop. Okay. So welcome. And I'm gonna start my first question to you, Levi. What even is a Master Builder? A Master Builder will oversee every part of the build. So from start to finish, everything is going to be overseed and built by me specifically, if it's a Levi Perry master built. Um, and you'll, you'll get a more hands-on experience of really dialing in what it is you want. I, I like, I'd take a, um, a reference that Scott Buell made that it kind of made it perfect was seeing it as in pixels, like with a picture. So the higher the pixels, the higher the quality of the picture. And then taking it from there, it's kind of like, well, each builder is his own photographer. And so each one has his own style and kind of flair. So you kind of pick the photographer you want, but you're going to get the highest resolution photo. Okay. <laughs> well, and so you've both been uh, master builders. You're, you're part of probably a newer generation of master builders in, in that custom shop team. We were talking over lunch that I kind of remember for the first 20 odd years of the custom shop, there seemed like there were four or five master builders and that, that was it. And over the last three or four years, um, it doesn't seem like it's massive. Is it doubled the size of the team? I mean, is, is that is there what eight, nine, ten builders now, master builders? Well, we have twelve um, at least. Yeah, I think thirteen. 12, thirteen. Maybe. Okay. So, to you, Austin, then, what does it take to become a master builder at Fender? Well, it's again that it's different for for each of us. Um, just having the expertise in every aspect that it involves. Mm -hmm. You know. You know, I know like you came up through the company, I came out from outside the company and it's just years of, you know, years of working on guitars mm -hmm. and working on all different kinds of guitars and different custom requests and yeah, it's just, just a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. that, uh, so I know, again, let's perhaps talk about that. So you, you are a, you are a Fender lifer. Right, straight out of high school or yeah. college or whatever you're allowed to leave now in America. Um, <laughs> the but you just started on the regular production line, did you in, in Fender? Yeah, yeah. So how many? You know, what, what's the how many years were you doing that, and how were you promoted up? So I started in we call it PL10, but um, American Standard doing setups, mm -hmm. um, setting up guitars. I started there, probably did that about three years, I think, and then I moved into the custom shop where I was doing relicking, set up, making custom pick guards, kind of just a lot of things, which really helped me kind of get some chops and mm -hmm. some experience. I did that for two years. Actually, I did that for one year. And then I moved into the custom shop customer service. So repairing anything that had gotten returned for any reason whatsoever. And so some of those returns, it could have been a master built. So it was like, I, that was kind of the gateway into Mm -hmm. becoming an apprentice because I'm now I'm working with the master builders and I'm kind of getting in learning what they do and then I did that for one year and then I became an apprentice mm -hmm. I started out I think my first project as an apprentice was the Game of Thrones <laughs> oh wow <laughs> and so those were fun it, I actually really enjoyed it because it wasn't just getting the the dirty end of the the apprentice job where it's like you're going to do a lot of sanding and a lot of setting up and a lot of a lot of the day in and day out things where it was like, no, we're getting thrown into gold leafing and filing steel, hard steel pick guards with crazy <laughs> stuff on it. So those, that was really cool because it was like, okay, I get to do something totally different and totally new. Then I became John Cruz's apprentice for mm -hmm. about almost two years. After that, I spent just being a floating apprentice. Mm -hmm. So I worked for all of the builders, which was great because yeah. it's like, I get to learn a little bit from everyone and kind of pull different things from each guy and really kind of hone in on my style mm -hmm. as time progressed. And then I've been promoted last year. Well, we'll we're, I do want to talk about your own individual styles, but y your journey into the um, custom shop uh, came through working for companies outside of Fender. So, to, and, and again, uh, whereas Levi was born within, you know, a few miles of the Fender sort of factory, you, you've uh, moved to California from Canada. Yeah. Uh, but so tell us, you know, you, I, I know you mentioned you worked uh, with Ron Thorne yeah. w went outside of the custom shop, but how did you get into kind of gear, guitar building? Uh, well, I was just 
my dad was always tinkering on guitars, mm -hmm. like not building by any means, but tinkering. So I was, it was always around. And so I had an interest early on and I came to California to go to the guitar building school, which, you know, that brought me out here. And then I was lucky enough to get brought on. I ended up teaching there for five years wow. after I was a student. So essentially you got to continue my education and get paid for it, <laughs> which is a nice, a nice situation. Uh, but while I was there, Ron Thorne, he hired me. I came on, worked with him for 11 years, probably, maybe, maybe more, Amazing. something like that. So a kind of apprenticed under him. So did sorts. you go into Fender as an apprentice master builder as well, or just straight in as a master builder? Straight in. Right. So Ron went on to become a master builder, and then I was doing my own thing for a few years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the opportunity came up for a spot, and it's not something you turn down. No, for sure, <laughs> for sure. So I jumped at the chance and came on, came onto the team, and it's cool. yeah, it's been great. Well, we we started talking actually bizarrely to to both of you about maybe a year ago because we'd made a we'd made a conscious decision that the way we wanted Anderton's relationship with Fender Custom Shop to be w was to perhaps try and work with some of the newer, the younger master builders. It cut, you know, as obviously everyone will know of, 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 of um, Todd Krauss and Dale Wilson, and obviously, you know, a little bit further back, John Cruz and people like that. Sure. And they all seem to have, they sort of, they're almost famous for their, very traditional approaches to building um, replicas of vintage uh, Fender guitars. And then we started looking at guys like you and Carlos Lopez and stuff, because you seem to be bringing up um, like a fresher approach to things that you wanted to do. And we were like, oh, that's kind of cool and exciting to work with. But where do you, you know, what do you, when you approach a master built, design where, where do you think your influences are being drawn from you know what what you talked about seeing the pixels you know where does that come from it's different for me than than some of the older guys i'm, I'm a 90s kid so <laughs> so to me seeing a jazz master a jaguar that's normal like that mm -hmm. that's, that was everywhere at the time for me so it's like i naturally draw towards some of those and even some of the crazier squire models is the tornado i love that shape the supersonic as crazy it is because mm -hmm. i those are a little more normal to me so it's not this crazy thing to build one for me. Whereas for some of the other guys, it'd be like, why would anyone build this thing? Let's do a Strat and a Tele. So seeing that kind of shaped where I wanted to go. And even, even just looking at Fender's history, it's like when, when Leo was making these, he was being groundbreaking. Like mm -hmm. he was pushing the boundaries of what could be done. So it's not outside of Fender to be able to do that and push the boundaries. So I, I like to tie those two in. It's like, yeah, I can build a heavy relic strat that looks awesome, and I love it. I love that part of it, mm. and I love the relicing part of it, but I also want to push the boundaries elsewhere, too. So it's bringing in the vintage history that, you know, it's a rich history, and then tying in, pushing the boundaries, doing something crazy. <laughs> and what, what's your, you know, if Levi's is into the sort of the Jaguar or the Jazzmaster thing, what, what, you know, where, do you, where does your inspiration start? Me? Well, I mean, a Telecaster is my favorite guitar. Mm -hmm. So I... Yeah, you know, I'd lean to that a lot. But then also I, I came on and did the Jerry Garcia guitar. Right. Too. So that Amazing. Yeah, that was a fun experience. And that got I got to showcase some you know u unique skills on that with I mean that thing is it's barely a strat anymore. So <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's taking cues from the historical accuracy of stuff, but but, you know, getting outside the box a little bit too and having fun with different finishes and and experimenting with, you know, just kind of off the wall finishes and that, it's, it's a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah. If you had to pick, um, you know, if you had to pick a guitar from Fender's sort of rich history uh, in terms of, you know, I'm talking down to specific colors and years and mods that have been done, what, what would you each choose you know what's your what's your go-to like that's the best for me a jazz master Let's for see. sure um with Let's grab that one there
think you've made right yeah um is this sort of typical of you know i'm looking at this now going well that's obviously you know a, a modified kind of part yeah. isn't it um what else might be on here that's you know your little license you know poetic license on a guitar yeah um well this trim even though it looks like the vintage one is actually the panorama trim which i've been throwing on everything i, I love this trim um so that's something that's kind of modern. It, it's great. You just tap it and you get some like flutters out of it. It's it's a lot of fun. This one specifically doesn't have the fuzz put in it, but I've been putting a lot of effects inside of a lot of jazz masters lately. So that has been something. And even even going crazy and doing something that has a mis mismatched headstock. So okay. it, it looks like maybe someone, you know. Do you just talk about the color as a mismatch? Yes. Yeah, so it could, right. I, I had one that was, um, what was it? Candy apple red, and then but the headstock was Olympic white, so it was almost as if it came from a different neck, as if someone just yeah. played the crap out of this neck and they needed yeah. a new one, so yeah. they put on another jazz master neck. Just getting crazy with it and having fun. That's kind of what I like to do. That's very cool. Flip, flip the back of that. I mean, well, Pete's going to be playing some of these as well. I mean, the the choice of of that sort of bird's eye. Um, pattern within that neck and then the, yeah. the way it's been stained and aged as well it just looks amazing that does i think that well, that neck would grace any guitar for sure yeah. but austin so the black telly that's there yeah obviously you you couldn't get much more um traditional than that sort of style of guitar so is this you know what are you trying to bring to you know what what you know what what in your mind is the 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 epitome of telecasters in that sort of in all the years that you know fender have made a telecaster and i think it's just a perfect workhorse but it's also a perfect like place to start for you know if you want to get some customizations going i mean this one doesn't have too much for customizations but it is black over a butterscotch mm -hmm. so i like to come up with a rough made up history when you're relicking something so it's just maybe not a factory refin but someone who had one and decided to paint it black so themselves so you're thinking about how did this guitar start off and what life has it led and what journey has it been on and that's dictating yeah yeah how you, it's, that's cool it, it it makes it fun you know you could imagine the fictional history of the instrument but those early 50s telecasters is that do you almost you know are you i i think i often look at not just Fender guitars, you know, many of the historic brands of guitars, and you just go, they so smashed it, like, straight off the bat, didn't they? And they really everything did. we've kind of, all of the um, developments and modifications and spec changes that happened, you know, in the 60, 70 years since the first ones came out, you're sort of going, do, do I just, was any of that really necessary? It was so <laughs> perfect. But, I mean, I know, you know, everyone will have their own opinion on that. But sure. is that what you're drawn to? Because I, I, you know. It is, yeah, it is. It's, I mean. And, and, and on the, so how much of the Telecaster do you think was a happy accident? It, you know, it, how have, it's such a simplistic design. It really is, Two yeah. pieces of wood, you know, bolted together. There's all sorts of, discussion as to why was the wood chosen for the body was it was it for some sort of sonic or was it just cheap and available and you know uh, and the pickups are simple the bridge is simple it's like 
Is it just a happy accident that it's so amazing? Or do you think actually secretly Leo Fender just knew exactly <laughs> what to do, you know? It's hard to say. There's definitely some efficiency evolved, like involved in the design. You know, modular, take the neck off, like, mm. you know, replace the neck if you need, like, the control plate, like, it, it, it looks like a great design to us now, but it's so simple. It's just a piece of metal with the hardware on there so yeah. you can drop it in. It's, it's really, it might be a happy accident, but there might be some, you know, I mean, there's definitely some Leo genius in it, too. Mm. It's, I, I think it's the perfect guitar. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it, it's, I often say with Telecasters, it, it feels like it might be where you start because it's so widely available and cheap and everything like that. But then you'll go, but I, I sort of feel it's one of those guitars, not a terribly forgiving guitar. So you might then go Strat, Les Paul, Jazzmaster, so, you know, something where you're thinking, oh, I've got some more options here, different stuff. But I think the really great guitar players end up back on the telly because it's almost like you got to show me what you've got now because I'm I'm not helping. You know, I'm not here to get you out of trouble. You just got to do what you do. Sure. And that's why I think so many great guitar players just end up on that. And the bridge pickup on a Telecast is just, yeah, it just does a thing, yeah. doesn't it? It really does. I, yeah. th I think it's it, maybe even explain. I know we're probably people watching this are more interested in in some of the the more advanced elements of master building and we'll talk about that sure. but just explain why a bridge pickup on a because people would that is not just a single coil at the back of a, a guitar like a strap single coil is is it no no it's not it's a different it's a different beast for sure it it just it cuts through like like no other single coil that like it it'll cut through the mix it'll break up and be aggressive if you want it to or it can sounds sweet it, it's it's so versatile mm -hmm. it just you know you don't even need the neck pick, like an esquire that's <laughs> you can <laughs> yeah. get by now you're going too. super brave you're yeah. not even gonna have <laughs> the neck pickup it's just like just the bridge pickup yeah. um let's go back to um perhaps I, I was intrigued when you said you got to be this kind of floating apprentice that yeah. that must have been mad and I, and I don't know how much austin this kind of um uh, you can relate to this as well, or whether you, because you came in as a master builder straight away, whether you, you, you didn't get so involved with the other guys. But, I mean, what must it have been like for, like you say, a you know, 90s kid coming in, and if you're a guitar nerd, you, you, some of the names at the custom shop are like household names, aren't they? Yeah. So what, what was that, you know, who, who did you enjoy working with the most? What do you think you learned from each of those builders? Yeah, I enjoyed working with all of them. It, it's been great working with all of them. And like I was saying, just pulling together knowledge from different areas because you can get stuck just doing one thing every day as mm -hmm. an apprentice and it's like that's just your thing but when you work for all of them it's like each guy wants something different some help with something else and so you get a bigger variety of things you're learning mm -hmm. and and that's always cool because you, you get some crazy stuff you get to work on and then you get some more standard stuff and you kind of get to hone in because you got you got to hone in the basic everyday stuff like mm -hmm. that's that's the bread and butter of the guitar like you got to hone in those skills but it's fun to branch out and do gold leafing or do things like that. I've I've always been right now. I work right next to to Dale, so I've always been really close with Dale mm -hmm. um, and just picking his brain all the time because he's awesome. But yeah, I, with all of them, even Scotty. Scotty, I go to Scotty <laughs> to like to dial down my crazy ideas because Scotty's right. not afraid to tell me when something is really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll usually find this fine balance of like. I'm going too crazy with this. I'll take it to Scotty. He'll insult everything about it. And I'll say, okay, I'll take away a couple of things. And then I find something that actually, like, it helps. It helps mm -hmm. me kind of build something that's actually better because it's not just run through my own head. Cool. You talked about, it sounds like you guys have a fair amount of space for a bit of sort of creative freedom. I'd always... I'd always assumed that, you know, a master builder came to work and, you know, the manager would go, right, here's what you got to build this week kind of thing. But is it different to that? Is there a sort of, you know, again, to Austin, do you just, what's the ratio of time just going, I'm just going to work on some projects of my own versus building what customers have asked you to build? It's, I mean, there's, there's definitely, we're, we're completing orders and, and yeah. making sure people are getting the guitars that they order, but at the same time, we're having fun and, and coming sure. up with stuff on our own. Like it's, it's kind of, if we want to, we work as long as we want. If we want to 
throw in a couple extra ones and just, you know, create our own creations. We get to do that too, which yeah. is... It certainly feels like, and I saw your, what did you call the fuzz? You, the you get, fuzz brain. The fuzz brain. This, this came up at, at a Fender auction uh, recently where, um, I mean, this, this is, is always freaks me out. You think such is the demand for master built stuff. We have to bid to be able to buy <laughs> the guitars that these guys make or some of the guitars these guys make. Not bid in a financial way, but you have to say, you know, I, I put, please put my name in the hat for that one and that one and that one and that one. And then they'll pull names out of the hat and go, oh, this dealer gets this guitar and this dealer gets this guitar. And I was hyper disappointed that we didn't get the, the, the fuzz uh, guitar that you made before. Um, maybe we can show a picture of that on screen. I'm pretty sure my friends at Chicago Music Exchange uh, got that guitar. So at least I know it went to a, a good home. But talk us through, you know, what, what were the features of that guitar that were... Um, obviously non-standard and just, again how and why I mean where's that coming from because I don't think Carlos I think was yeah. doing a bit like that wasn't he and he's certainly gone on to sort of carry on doing that at um, the Castadoza guitars but yeah. I don't know that any of the other builders have really stepped out of their that comfort zone quite as much as yeah. you have so for me I, 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 I've been working on pedals just for fun as a hobby for the last three years probably. So I would kind of dove into that world of building circuits, building fuzz, simple stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so if you don't know about a smuggler telly, it's in the 60, 67 smugglers. Mm -hmm. In 67, Fender got a bunch of ash that was really, really heavy. So under the pick guard, they routed out a bunch of things that you would never see. You wouldn't even know if you had one unless you took off the pick guard. Mm -hmm. And so they call it the smuggler telly because people would smuggle oh, things. But people, most people don't even know if they had one unless they take the pick guard off. So my, my thinking was, well, if Super I'm... Super popular with some of the big rock bands in the 70s. Yeah, I'm not sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> my thinking was, though, is, okay, if I'm in, if, if I'm in the 70s, right, and if I had one and I found out that... I take off the pickguard and I find out that there's all this space under there. What would I do? And so I would throw in a fuzz, an octave up, and a, and a delay inside awesome. there and put all the controls right on the guard. And within room, it, it, if you see a picture of it or if you play it, it has um, like a kill switch. Like, you know, the John 5 has that kill switch button, but it's not a kill switch. It sends the delay into to havoc mode. It sends it into full oscillation. So right at just the, right at the push of a button. And then I also specifically put the time knob right next to it and kind of really thought this layout through so that you're playing it you can hold down 
the button, send it into oscillation, and then you can use your thumb to just send it into these crazy time warping <laughs> sounds. And then you got the octave up, and then you've got the fuzz in there. And so that was my thinking was, what would I do if I had this? And then it has a crazy kind of 70s, like, like the George Harrison, how he hand painted that, you know, yeah. super psychedelic paint job. That was kind of the, the mindset there. So I went all out on that. That is a great, and I, you are going to make another one, right? Yes. So maybe we'll put a name down for that. Maybe we'll just order it anyway. <laughs> but I'm, I'm calling it now as well, just in case Mike Lewis is watching, he can have this idea for free. This will be Levi Perry, master built relic fuzz pedals coming from the custom shop. Oh no. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying it now. It's coming, right? It's coming, isn't it? Yeah, I knew it. I'll take um, one. I, <laughs> I kind of feel like there's probably, we, we probably should deep dive a little bit into um, the justification for the sort of the price tag that maybe comes on a master built guitar. So I, I think people accept that, you know, you can build guitars in the Far East where labor costs are less and, uh, you know, perhaps using local materials are less. Um, and then you pay a little bit more, obviously, if you want to start building them in the US, you're PL10 line that you mentioned, sort of standard stuff. And then you sort of go into custom shop, which adds, uh, you know, and I've done the, the tour of, of, of custom shop and you can kind of see how processes change. Um, maybe even the processes perhaps don't change as much as people might think, but the, the approach to building is not like, right, we've got 500 blue ones to make, make 500 blue ones. It's like, oh, we've got this one guitar with a unique spec for a customer that they want. That's what we have to build next. When you get into master built, you know, and you, you're, you're then talking about a guitar that's four times the price of say a PL10 guitar. What, what's the, you know, I don't, I hate to put you on the spot here, but like, what's the justification? Like, you know, what, what are you actually getting that, justifies the, the sort of the price tag. He says, that's like, I feel like, I feel like some hard hitting political interview here. <laughs> Justify your policy on home defense. Um, but yeah, what, what's, tell, you know, in, I think everyone accepts as well, you know, they're, they're, what do you call that law of diminishing returns? Yeah. So, you know, you, you pay, you know, pro rata more for a smaller incremental improvement, yeah. the higher up the scale you get. You're obviously at the, the sort of almost the, the top end of that. But, yeah. you know, yeah. You don't have to justify it to me, by the way, as well. I know we sell loads of them. I'm just saying, you just justify it to these people. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think when it comes to sound, sound is always an opinion. So mm -hmm. someone can say, oh, well, the Mexico strats sound better than the, the master built I played. So sound is one of those things. It's always going to be an opinion, and someone's always going to have an opinion on there. But quality is one of those things that it is not an opinion. There is better quality. Mm -hmm. and, and as you go up the ranges, you get, you get better and better quality. You get less hands touching it. And you get to build your dream guitar. So if you want a vintage spec Strat that's beat up, you know, super heavy relic, we're gonna do that. But if you want something crazy, you can start to push the boundaries and start to go outside of what's available. And as a master builder too, it's, it's fun to build what somebody wanted, but also we, we get to build what we would do and kind of, kind of show people, hey, you could also do this with the guitar. And so you kind of get a vision and dream toward pushing the guitar forward too, if you want to. So you, there's so much involved. How much effort, well not effort is right, how much skill and, and experience is required when you're doing the timber selection? Because again, that's something that 100% at the, at, the, at the cheaper end of the market, it's just gonna be a you know, great big pile of, of timber bought from wherever the cheapest place you could buy timber from that week, through to when you're into a custom shop and master builders are choosing timber, That's that's the, the hand selected, you know, hopefully the, the, the best, whatever the best means, you know, piece sure. of timber for the job. But what, what are you, you know, what are you looking for? Like? Yeah, just really quality pieces for lack of a better description. And also a wide variety of, of woods when you're in the, getting yeah. a master built, like mm -hmm. it's some, we work with all kinds of yeah. different stuff. So that's, part of the experience that you're getting with the master build. It doesn't necessarily have to be an alder body or a maple yeah. neck. You know, it's, you can really get outside the box mm. with as far as wood choices and, and you know, it's just the sky's the limit yeah. almost. With <laughs> what, does that, what does that even look like? I mean, I, it's been a few years since I was at the, the Fender Custom Shop and I, I can't recall exactly, although earlier this year I had the, 
uh, had a lot of fun going around the sort of Gibson and PRS and Martin facilities. And there's just like when, you know, they have these like little sort of vault areas where, they, where they'll make their equivalent of Masterbuilt product, if you like. And it, and it really feels like, you know, this is like the 0.01% of all the wood that's been delivered. Just like someone's gone, oof, that, that delivery or that piece there. But I mean, what, what, what do you, do you have this sort of same sort of equivalent vault uh, in, the, in the custom shop? Yeah, there's... Yeah. People, dealers will come through and pick some really cool, crazy pieces yeah. of lumber and say, hey, build this mm. out of it. And, and then uh, pickups wise, you guys, are you winding your own or are you, are you sort of speccing what you want? I mean, what, what, are you, what are you putting on the master belt stuff? They'll be Joseph, Josephina. Yeah, that's strictly master belt. Yeah. So, and she's the original uh, Not pickup. The original. Oh, okay. She learned from Abby. Abby yeah. was right, the that's original. Right, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So she's she's the sort of the, the like the apprentice if you yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> but for the last fifty years, or yeah, something. yeah, right. And uh, when you combine the the two, going back to like the wood, because I had a customer order, and he specked it out. It wasn't me. He had, he wanted a mahogany body, thin line, with a roasted maple neck, mm -hmm. and he wanted Josephina handwound P nineties because she does P nineties now, okay. and that guitar sang like just the combination. So it's like. As a customer, you can you can pick these things. You can go yeah. outside of what is stock elsewhere, and you can really get into a new realm. And it, that thing sung. That was a great guitar. Yeah. I guess when I see pictures of of um, you know, let's say you see fifty custom shop guitars, and they're doing one of these bidding things that we talked about earlier, I think you get to know the relicking as to like who. You know, and initially you just see lots of guitars that look cool and they've been relic, but then you start going. I'm pretty sure that's an Austin one, or I'm pretty sure that's a Levi one. Let's so say, do you is that sort of encouraged within the custom shop for you to put your own visual uh, stamp on on each guitar, or is that just something that happens because naturally you've got different techniques for for doing this stuff? I'd say it, it naturally happens because we do have a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. and as far, as far as how we accomplish it, so uh, everyone's natural look comes out yeah. organically. On their instruments like i'll see one posted and before i read the caption i'll be like oh that's yeah so and you know. so's yeah. and it's you know we, we can definitely spot each other's yeah for yeah. sure yeah did you when you were working have, did you have a um, like a preference as to do you, did you like one build as a super heavy relic or is there an, like is there a, is there like a go-to master builder if you just want the most destroyed ones and then maybe another master builder if you want the sort of the sort of lighter relics or what are you what's your yeah, John, John Cruz took up that space for a while, and Dale and Vince really have that nailed in. For the, he uh, for the heavier relic yes, stuff. Yes, for the mean. heavier relic stuff. Yeah. I tend to go a little heavier. I was going to say, you, you definitely go heavier. Yeah, heavy. I go yeah. heavier, especially on the colors, yeah. especially with the aging of the color. I like to take sonic blue and turn it into green and then watch the internet say, that's not blue. <laughs> but um, yeah, I do go a little heavier. That's cool. I mean, i, I got to ask you as well, if you were going to build... If you were going to order a master belt guitar from Fender Custom Shop, I think I know what you're going to say in terms of what you would order because we've sort of, you've implied that already in the, in the video. But who would you get to build it? Oh, I'd get Austin to build it. And then <laughs> I'd I would get have one him, from him. <laughs> I would have him build something that would be the vein of his existence, like an arch top <laughs> supersonic. Yes, there we go. Arch top supersonic. Yeah. In fact, that's a great question. And so, but what, what would you would you just have a telly and get Levi to make? It? <laughs> is, that, is this the politically correct answer for this video? Yes. But yeah, just I prefer that then. So, if you had to order a guitar, if you, if this was like some sort of um, get your own back sort of prank. <laughs> what would be what would be the guitar that you could order through Levi that you know he would hate the most, and then we'll do we'll flip the question the other way as well. Oh man! And maybe I'll order one of these just for <laughs> because. Yes. Oh, <sighs> so many options. I think I'd go Nos. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, it has to look like time capsule level. Pristine, okay. just because yeah. I know that would probably upset your just yeah. creative personality. <laughs> yeah. And what, what's the guitar? What's the bass model guitar? Oh, I got I gotta go. I gotta go. Telly, just. Oh really? Yeah, just. So he's one of what a butterscotch NOS fifty one no caster. <laughs> but maybe not go vintage crack. Maybe put some uh, some herringbone on there. Okay, I'd uh, like that. <laughs> yeah. And you'd go arch top supersonic, would you? Full. 
I'd make him spray it as an Antigua as well. As you make do what? Sorry, an Antigua. Finish. Ah, okay. Antigua Supersonic. <laughs> that's he likes Antigua, so it's yeah, right up his alley. I'll get back Supersonic. to you. With a, I'll get a quota <laughs> yeah, on that right. for you. <laughs> When we're interviewing artists and musicians and stuff like that, we, we always sort of say, you know, if you could put a band together or you could perform with anybody that you ever wanted to, who would it be? And so uh, sort of adapting that question for you, if, if you, you know, if, if, uh, if an order came through for you to build, you know, and it was from an artist, who, you know, who would be the, like, the iconic one where you just go, that's it, I'm retiring at the end of the day, I've done, you know, mission achieved in life. Who, who would that be for you? I have stuff I'm working on that I'm really excited about, but I can't say at the Ooh. moment. So there's some cool stuff coming out that, that I'm excited about. It's, it's right up my, my wheelhouse. But um, since I can't say those, let's just say... Is that going to be up there then? Like, as in, because you, you can't... That would be an artist that would fulfill that kind of bucket list yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. There's some cool so ones Justin coming. Bieber's doing it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Fair play. No, so, so who would it? Who would it really be? Um, just to set the internet ablaze, I would I would have Kurt Cobain uh, okay. smash something on stage that is worth a lot. Pete and I played Kurt Cobain's uh, D18 when okay. we were at the Martin Factory. I think it was a D18, wasn't it? Yeah. And that's just. Uh, I mean, I, I don't. <laughs> You're younger than I am, and I think obviously Kurt obviously had a more profound experience on your life, but than, than it did on mine. But still, strumming that guitar, you do get this weird sense of just like, oh my goodness me, you know, I'm actually playing a guitar that yeah. one of the most iconic, you know, musicians ever played. But, yeah. So Kurt, you do a Kurt Cobain, and what would you do? Like a Jag Slang kind of vibe, or yeah, whatever he wants to smash on stage. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, don't hold your breath on that one. Yeah. Um, so, how about you? Ah, well, I did one recently for Corey Wong. That was pretty cool. Cool? Yeah. Well, um, another Strat, or was he doing something different? It was essentially his signature one, but with a bound neck. Mm -hmm. So just an extra little touch for him. Uh, that was cool. He's a monster player, so it's nice to... But who who would be the... You know, again, living or dead, living obviously, or dead. you know, d less likely that it'll come true if you choose a dead artist. <laughs> but um, You never know. You never know. Uh, but who would it be? Like, if it was just so you could, you know, literally you know, tell your grandkids, I made a guitar for X. Well, loving Telecasters, like maybe Roy Buchanan. Wow. Yeah. Cool. That's old school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, why not? Yeah. And what do you think Roy would uh, order? Just a butterscotch just, deli, probably. I was going to say, <laughs> this is just... I like, do make other things. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah this, I, I get the... I get the there's a di the, the, the difference of opinion here. I, just, I love the fact it's like, you know, if you just want it how it used to be, then Austin's <laughs> your man. If you want something a little bit out there of how it, maybe it might be in the future, then I think Levi's your man. But in a way, I think that's why we've enjoyed working with the two of you so much and looking forward to doing stuff, because that's the beauty of the whole... Um, Fender lineup, isn't it? Is yeah. if you, you can have how it used to be, yeah. or you can have how it's gonna be. Um, so look, 
appreciate you guys coming in. Hope you've enjoyed watching this video and it's been interspersed with hopefully some footage of, of some of the guitars that uh, we were hoping we would have them today, but I think they're going to be here later this week. So we're, Pete's going to do some playing on those and we'll cut them into these videos. So if you've seen anything in the video that you like, give us a call. Um, it should be for sale. Um, but yeah, if you, you know, we're going to be working with these guys closely over the next two or three years, to, you know, realizing some of our dream guitars, maybe some of yours as well. Um, you can always contact our guitar team. But look, it's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you guys you. for coming in. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your time in the UK. Yeah, we will. Um, thank you guys for watching. And we will see you in the next video soon.